I don't know if slow money is a movement, but there is a movement. There, is a, there, are, there are thoughts, feelings, and you know, are moving in a new direction. And that direction is, is um, I guess I'll give the punchline away. An Investor Circle member said a number of years ago the following words, very simple, we must bring money back down to earth. I often um, credit E.F. Schumacher and Small is Beautiful um, as, let's say, being my kind of epiphany moment um, as a young man reading that book in the 70s was um, very important to me because um, th it is full of wisdom um, written by a Rhodes Scholar, industrial economist, uh, who worked at a very high level in, industrial, uh, in the British Coal Board for many years, and then later in his life, uh, in a sense, discovered Eastern philosophy and, and began realizing that there are other values that were at least as important, in fact, more important than economics. And he used the phrase meta-economics, which is a little bit of a cumbersome phrase, but the, 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 that book is so full of wisdom and inspiration that it was hard for me to get past it. And, and w when I read it, um, it occurred to me that basically everything we ever needed to know was in this book, so why weren't we doing it? And I would say um, um, I have been kind of stubbornly, you know, sometimes people say sometimes you find it, sometimes it finds you, so I guess it found me. You know, that book just got in me and didn't let me go. And um, I have been trying ever since to take pieces of that and translate it into action. And that's been the hard part. Um, uh, but, you know, each step of the way I've tried different things and now that process has led me to slow money, which hopefully will allow me to integrate all of these pieces into a, um, into a strategy that can um, have more impact. If we really want to end up with, let's say, tens of thousands of local first, independent, mission-driven enterprises and, a, let's say, a fertile soil of the economy, why aren't we investing in that? All the money is going in the exact opposite direction. So to me, what all this means is we have to think, what could we do now that might 25 years from now actually make a difference? We should be in putting the seeds in the ground for the other thing, something else that has to happen. And we can't know for sure exactly how it will evolve, but we know we need to do it. And I do think there is a chance we're at the beginning of something that could become very substantial over a 25-year period. In 1979, uh, I found myself uh, in a rather strange twist and turn, living on an international agricultural research station in Mexico where the Green Revolution actually was invented. We could say um, uh, Norman Borlaug, who got the Nobel Peace Prize for inventing dwarf wheat, which became the Green Revolution, worked at this institute, and I was working with the economists who are looking at some of the socioeconomic questions. And So if you think about formative steps along the way, working there was important. I was right in the belly of the Green Revolution. When I got there, I didn't know the difference between a corn, what a corn plant, a wheat plant looked like. Um, so that kind of got me started in one, one way. Um, then in the uh, 80s, uh, I was the young member of a startup company that was trying to create a, a, the business isn't particularly relevant, but um, it was a, a business that had significant social potential in terms of benefits. Didn't work, but in the course of this failed startup, I learned a lot about venture capital. Then I found my way working uh, with a small healthcare venture capital fund in most, most of the 80s. Kind of learned the, the nuts and bolts of doing uh, venture capital. This is, this is to me a big like turning of a wheel back to ideas which were articulated very powerfully in the 70s and just got kind of stuck in the compost pile or the whatever, and now they're starting to sprout you know, 40 years later. So that's a long way of saying, well, I have one sentence here from E.F. Schumacher, which is, the wealthier a society, the more difficult it becomes to do things that do not have an immediate payback. I don't feel like what we're doing at Slow Money is asking any new questions, really. I think we're just asking the old, we're just stubbornly asking the only questions that really matter. And then, but I think what is new is we're trying to take experience with venture capital and let's say the the world as we've come to know it in the last 25 years, both financially and technologically, and trying to take that, the benefits of that, and, and now recast it in a different way. Um, and that sounds very abstract, so just to make it a little more concrete, I'd say we want to support tens of thousands of entrepreneurs who are doing the right thing with small food enterprises, small farm CSAs, processing, niche organic brands, local restaurants, all these things that are going on that we know are vital to we can call it the soil of the, of the economy if we want to talk, use the metaphor, or we can just say to the health of local communities and bioregions. Um, we need to find a way to take a meaningful portion of our capital and redesign it, redesign our expectations so that it will do that and nothing but that and be happy doing that and not try to turn that into something else. Now this is the long one. This is David Orr. I know you can't really see it, so I'm going to sit down and just read it. There is an appropriate velocity for water set by geology, soils, vegetation, and ecological relationships in a given landscape. 
there is an appropriate velocity for money that corresponds to long-term needs of communities rooted in particular places and to the necessity of preserving ecological capital. There is an appropriate velocity for information set by the assimilative capacity of the mind and by the collective learning rate of communities and entire societies. Having exceeded the speed limits, we are vulnerable to ecological degradation, economic arrangements that are unjust and unsustainable, and in the face of great and complex problems to befuddlement that comes with information overload. I can't think of a paragraph that would ever say more than that. As soon as you go down this path, um, you open yourself up to um, lots of questions and confusion from people who have money, and if we take for a second people who have a lot of money, just as one group of people, who um, it's hard not to think should be at the first wave of this, um, uh, when you go to those people, you immediately come up against a mindset that says, you know, is this a bond return for an equity risk? Is it philanthropy? Is it venture capital? What the hell is it? And the answer is, it doesn't actually fit into any of those categories. It's neither philanthropy nor investing. It's both. It's an integral approach to using your wealth to do the right thing. Um, and there's a lot of subtext in each of these discussions, but I think I would summarize them by saying there isn't enough philanthropy to solve the world's problems. Philanthropy is by definition an end of the pipe solution. You get philanthropy after you've created a lot of wealth and put it aside somewhere. Um, I sometimes joke that philanthropy isn't slow money. Philanthropy is dead fast money. <laughs> um, meaning that if we don't have an integral approach to using money the right way the first time, you can't take fast money, dump it in a bucket, and then turn it into slow money after the fact. So we need to find a more integral approach. We don't have time to create the next thousand billionaires or the next 10,000 billionaires and hope they will use a fraction of their money to solve the problems. And um, how do you do that? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I can say the way we're trying to do it. And we are trying to explicitly hold culture and finance together at the same time, meaning not letting people only look at this as an asset class, but explicitly affirming that this is about cultural transformation, consciousness shift, personal investment, meaning bringing your whole self to the investment, not allowing to yourself just to think like an investor, and it's all an abstraction. And, and the, if you get through all that, what do you get? You get some form of an epiphany, some form of a change of attitude, if you don't want to be so highfalutin, that people have to come to, that this is the right thing to do, that saying things like we need to bring money back down to earth is not crazy, it actually is true, and we have to dare to just think more simply and more concretely about what we're doing. In 1900, the global economy was $600 billion. Today, the world economy grows by this amount every two years. Pesticide and fertilizer use up, genetic diversity down, soil erosion up, food safety questions up, nutrition down, obesity up, Twinkies up, food miles up, food traditions down, threat level red. We're trying to create a, a, a way of thinking about investing that allows you to bring your heart and mind with you as an investor. And if you do that, you can't just do the same old thing anymore. You can't just put your money into a mutual fund knowing that let's say half of every dollar is going up a smokestack in China because you know that's wrong. But if you think only like an investor, you think you have nothing else you can do. And so the trick is to get the whole person connected to the investor part of the person and then once that happens, I think a lot of good things can uh, unfold.